Yellow. Hey, Taylor. Hey, buddy. So you still sitting in traffic? Still sitting in traffic. So it's a good time for the emergency pod? I suppose so. All if right. ever there were a good time, it, it feels like this is just compounding the sadness. All right. So people will know from the title, <laughs> this is the Jonathan Gonzalez has chosen Mexico emergency podcast. We're going to kind of get into how and why it happened and maybe, you know, look at it from a few different angles. But I want to start with, uh, how, how did you find out, Taylor? Uh, I woke up, I think I tend to always wake up and check Twitter because that seems to be uh, the way the world is <laughs> right is, now. That, that is unhealthy. happen overnight. <laughs> yeah, I know it is, but that's the way it goes. And in this situation, I think the first thing I woke up to was that tweet that uh, Univision was reporting that he had decided to represent Mexico. Yeah. Then I read a few more, and then I immediately texted you and then recognized that you were probably uh, also still asleep. Yeah, so I, um, in my defense, I worked very late last night. We did the show. Yeah. I came home, did some copywriting to meet a deadline. Still working on that, by the way. Um, <laughs> so then I kind of slept in <laughs> till, I want to say, 10.30 or so. I woke up, and I don't check Twitter immediately, but I do. Um, actually, full disclosure, I check my blood sugar on my phone. Um, and, then oh, yeah. I, and then I saw a text message from you saying, I can't remember the exact wording, but it was something like, um, sorry, you have to wake up to bad news. Yeah. <laughs> And turns out it was, I mean, I thought it was political or something like that, but it turns out it was Jonathan Gonzalez choosing Mexico. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and to be fair, I check my messages before anything, uh, because <laughs> that always tends to be the more important of the things, because usually that means I miss something. Yeah, just today it happened to be the case that it was uh, major breaking news. Okay, so should we get to the how? How has this happened? Sure. I'm kind of asking you. Do you have an answer? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, okay, yeah, I can give you a, a rough overview which is that sure. it seems to me that U.S. soccer kind of took it for granted for too long and that Mexico yep. saw an opportunity and have moved in, right? I, I read in the report, I think yeah. it was in the, either in the Univision report, um, which I Google translated, or in the sort of ESPN FC confirmation by Tom Marshall, after I think it looked like he'd called some sources that he trusted, right? Um, mm -hmm. That essentially... Um, the Mexican Federation had sent a representative to see Jonathan Gonzalez in California with his family over the winter break, which mm -hmm. I essentially think means the holidays, right? And also yeah. that Juan Carlos Osorio had made a phone call to him. And I think they'd kind of persuaded him, um, especially mm -hmm. in the context of a lack of content from the U.S. Soccer Federation. I mean, that's not the entire explanation, yeah. but that's definitely a part of it. That's what's happened in the past few weeks. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's probably more or less uh, the truth. And that's where I think even like last week, we started to see those stories about not getting caught up for Portugal and not being contacted and having yeah. was frustrated by that. And I think you and I, if we go back and like listen to that again or remember that conversation, I think we kind of accidentally stumbled upon maybe this is cover. And it felt a little bit at the time like this seems like a weird time to kind of release this information unless you're preparing to drop the bomb that you have decided to switch federations. Oh, I see. And that's where I'm inclined to believe that this has probably been more or less a long time coming, at least a month, if not longer. And I feel like the Portugal, the lack of consideration for Portugal didn't help, but I don't think it was the kind of uh, breaking point that a lot of people are making out. I disagree. I think he was expecting okay. to at least be contacted for that game, and that's what hurt him. Because yeah, that's true. The, the, the news that came out about sort of being unhappy that no one had called him around the November for the mm -hmm. Portugal game, it's not as if there was a, a Jonathan Gonzalez press release, right? He didn't craft this statement and put it out. It was an interview with, I think, Soccer America, um, yeah. where they, they literally asked him what happened, and he said, no mm -hmm. one called me. Do you know what I mean? So it seems to be more of an organic bit of news that came out because someone very smartly asked the question, as opposed to Jonathan Gonzalez was sort of planning his media strategy. Bear in mind, he's 18 well, yeah. years old. He's a teenager. You didn't have a media strategy when you were 18. Well, I mean, that's no, but I also wasn't <laughs> Jonathan Gonzalez when I was 18. That's not quite a direct equivalency there. No, and I'm not saying that it's like some conspiracy where it's been this elaborate plan, but like, I have to believe that other people have asked, hey, who are you going to represent? Have you talked to anybody from the U.S. Soccer Federation? Yeah. And I have to believe that maybe didn't get answered or at the time was sort of like, no, I'm focused on club stuff. And, you know, that's kind of the generic answer. Mm -hmm. And I just wonder if maybe him saying, what if, if it was over the holiday, that then after the holiday to come out and say, oh, no, no one contacted me. It just feels a little bit like it's not a coincidence. Yeah, yeah. That like, the dam was breaking, later, right? The dam was breaking yeah. at that point. All right, can, yeah. we go, can we go back to that November friendly then? 
I remember yeah. on our show, we were very excited that we were going to get um, a Gonzalez call-up. And uh-huh. we thought it was going to yep. be the dream midfield, which it looks like now will not happen, mm-hmm. of Gonzalez, McKenney, and Adams, my sort of three-man central mm-hmm. midfield, which I think is what the, the first thing that made me optimistic in the aftermath of the 2017 October unpleasantness, yeah. as I'm sort of rebranding mm-hmm. it now we're in 2018. Um, and then November came around and he wasn't called up. And from reports mm-hmm. that we saw, it was that Monterey had games, one rescheduled game and one cup game that were both very close to that Portugal friendly. And therefore, Monterey had said, can you not call him up? We kind of need him right now. And he's going to miss games if you call him up. And that US soccer mm-hmm. had sort of... Um, I thought at the time it seemed like the smart decision, in hindsight, I disagree with myself, um, to not not get on the wrong side of Monterey, not annoy them early in the player's career and just let him stay for a bit. But if you're going to do... Because it was was a proper FIFA schedule friendly, right? It was a FIFA date, meaning if US had called him up, he would have... They would have had to release him, right? There there would have been no excuse not to release him. And I think he would have gone because there's no paperwork, right? Right now he's got to file the paperwork. He's got to make a big effort to switch to Mexico. Mm-hmm. That He could have just got on a plane and gone to Portugal and it would, would have been all smooth. Um, so, okay, mm-hmm. even if... Sorry, I'm going on a bit of a rant here, but even if um, you sort of respect Monterey's wishes, don't call him up, you have to call him and explain what's just happened, right? You can't just expect him to figure it out. And it seems like yeah, that is what happened. Because like- he said, personally, no one contacted me. Yeah, and that's where I'm 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 still sort of at a loss because like I think what is probably especially frustrating for people, uh, for at least fans of the US national team right now, is that like it is evident that somebody or a group of somebody's dropped the ball here. Yep. But because there's no real like Sunil Galati stepping down, so it's kind of tough to blame him. I mean, I still blame him certainly for other past mistakes, but like there's no central figure to be like, you messed up, you're going to be held accountable for this. And when you don't have that person to focus on, I think that makes it worse. Yeah. But in this situation, I think like maybe that also is what happened, that there's no central figure. So there was just sort of like, oh, yeah, we contacted Monterey. It, it, like the best equivalent I can come up with is like telling your boss, like, hey, by the way, I'm going out of town in two weeks. And him being like, OK, and then not then following up to be like, here are the dates I need off and just assuming like, oh, it's OK. He must know that I need those dates off. So we're fine. Yeah. And never really confirming like, oh, by the way, we definitely want you to play for us long term and please stay with us forever and don't break up with us. <laughs> and instead, it seems like nobody made that call. So, yeah, I think it's twofold. I think um, th- there are people still technically in place, right? Dave Sarakin is the sort of acting yeah. slash temporary, whatever you want to call it, mm-hmm. head coach of the U.S. men's national team. Therefore, it is on him to make that phone call, right? There's no general manager or anything like that who can take responsibility for it. It is absolutely mm-hmm. on Dave Sarakin to to make that phone call. Um, I don't want to like blame him too hard because he's in a weird position, right? Where he kind of didn't expect to have that job and maybe he's not well suited to sort of, you know, overseeing an entire program in this way. So he's kind of like the wrong man interject- in the wrong place at the wrong time. Yeah, and I just want to interject to say like, I don't blame him at all, to be honest, because this is a guy who what the report came out yesterday that he interviewed for the St. Louis University coaching job and probably won't get it. Like, that's where he is right now. So the idea of him being responsible for recruiting this player, and then what's he going to say? Like, yeah, I know I'm not going to be there, but and I know you've probably like not really heard of me, even though I'm involved in U.S. soccer and you've been involved (laughs) in U.S. soccer. Like, I know each other in passing, but like, please right. play for us. No, I think but, you don't have that person there. But he was the head coach or the acting yeah. head coach or whatever it was of the U.S. men's national team for that November game that Jonathan Gonzalez expected to be called up for and did not get called up for. So all Sarakin has to do is dial the numbers, get the, get the number from Tabramas or U.S. soccer, dial, from Bruce Arena. Bruce Arena was in contact with him, right? Um, dial the numbers and explain to Jonathan Gonzalez what is happening. So there is some blame in that he could have picked up the phone. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a hindsight thing, to be honest, though. Um, like, because this is like, he didn't know. I mean, at the time, to your point, like, we didn't even know what his title was. We didn't know if this was going to be like a one game he's in charge and then he is moved on and you have some interim appointment in January or a permanent hire in January. Yeah. And so I think then, like, I'm inclined to believe that he probably didn't even call up the people that he quote unquote called up. Like, I'm, I still think he was given a list or had the list from Arena, and it was like, okay, these are the people. Like, I wouldn't be surprised to learn that Dave Sarakin didn't call anybody to say, hey, you're in that roster. He was just sort of like, hey, here are the guys you're getting. Good luck. Here's, I mean, I don't know that, but that's an interesting theory. Yeah, I guess that's theory. unfair because we don't know that, but it's my feeling, yeah. 
I think maybe he was guided to do that, right? Because the US wanted, yeah. US soccer would have wanted mm. a sort of uh, refreshing of the roots kind of thing. Um, how about yeah. um, the idea that like it could have been maybe Tab Ramos should have picked up the phone and called mm-hmm. Jonathan Gonzalez? He, I mean, he definitely knows him. He called him into uh, the U20 World Cup qualifying, the, the CONCACAF Championship. Jonathan Gonzalez, as a 17-year-old, was in that U20 squad. He was the youngest player there. Yeah. And then he almost made the U20 World Cup squad. Uh, for May. So Tab Ramos definitely has a relationship with Gonzalez going back. He maybe could have called him and explained what was going on. Someone, Mm -hmm. Michael Bradley maybe could have done it, the captain of the US national team, like somebody. And so instead of blaming all these people individually, I want to kind of call it a structural failure kind of caused by the World Cup, right? So the failure to qualify for the World Cup, we can maybe talk about whether that's a draw for Gonzalez to go uh, and switch to a team that did not fail to qualify for the World Cup. But it also, yeah. the fallout I mean, of that was sort of, you know, Sunil Galati being kind of a dead man walking in terms of his job, Bruce Arena being fired. And Bruce Arena was in contact with Gonzalez, right? He had mm-hmm. apparently called him in August. So Bruce Arena being got rid of means that his, that contact is gone. And so suddenly there's just this vacuum of power at US soccer. So there was sort of no one to communicate to him or no one took responsibility for it. I think I've just hit on the thing. Yeah. That's it. No one took responsibility because there was no one with the authority to do so. And and I do want to add though that like I and I forget who made this point on Twitter, so I apologize. But like I do feel like there's this narrative of the U.S. dropped the ball, and it's 100 percent their fault. And it certainly is a lot of people making a lot of mistakes. But I don't like the idea that like Mexico have been there this whole time, and they've been this sort of like, hey, we're here if you need us, we're always around, and that they like played this perfectly. This wasn't a player that they really knew about or really cared about it was the U.S. who brought him in at what, U14 or U15 level? Yep, Hugo Perez, I believe, was his coach, his uh, yeah. team coach, yeah. So it, it does feel like, like I guess I just don't like that, like, oh, we didn't call, call him up call him up for Portugal, and that was us, like, ignoring him. It's like, well, Mexico ignored him right up until he was really good for Monterey, and then they were like, yep, we want you now. But so, isn't like, that this, narrative kind of frustrates me. But isn't this, yeah, the U.S., like, I, I don't agree with the idea that he's fallen through the cracks either, right? Because he was very much yeah. sort of in the system, right? Which is a, a kind of what you're getting at, right? That he was in the U.S. soccer mm-hmm. system. He was committed to playing for the U.S. He sort of, uh, when he when he made that move from California uh, to Liga MX yeah. after he was spotted in kind of a showcase, uh, he deliberately did not uh, sign with Chivas because of their policy of um, right. Mexicans or uh, Mexican Americans who've rejected the US only. Um, so he was very much committed, but the ball has been dropped in the last couple of months, and I think that's what it is. And what what worries me is that I think it was kind of dropped because of arrogance. I look at you like there's a bit yep. of the, the power vacuum that we talked about, but I also think of it as um, this is the US being like yeah, we're here, we're the best, he's going to come along to us eventually, he's just got to wait a little bit longer. Instead of being like, oh, this could go the wrong way, we should make sure that we sort of reach out and make sure that we secure this. Yeah, I mean, I think if you go back to like Sunil Gulati saying, oh, if we don't hit the post, like it's a different story. Like yeah. that's how close it was. Like I think when that's your approach to not qualifying for the World Cup, mm-hmm. then yeah, you're, it's then going to be a sort of drop the ball across the board because nobody is really taking any sort of accountability for how to fix things and it just becomes like yeah everything's fine whatever we don't need to worry about it of course he's going to choose us he's he's, all the signs are that he's chosen to root for us and i think that's also going to be really hard for us to go back and listen to our 2018 specific predictions because we were both super excited for that was only last week jonathan gonzalez makes this yeah but i mean we both went with when he makes his first cap for the u.s national team yeah and again i think that was it i think the u.s soccer i think there was kind of always an approach of oh, this is a fake story. This is people trying to, like, drum up nerves and, and, and have clickbait articles about how U.S. is about to lose this really exciting prospect. And and maybe that was part of it, but it does feel now like, no, there was always a little bit more smoke to this one, and people just kind of didn't recognize that it was a reality. I mean, so, I'll throw myself in there and say, like, I absolutely thought he was always going to end up representing the USA. Mm-hmm. It, I kind of never believed that he wouldn't, and yeah. maybe that is that arrogance we're talking about, or maybe it's just, like, all of the signs were there that he had chosen the USA, and I just didn't realize how much the ball had been dropped. But either way, here we are. So uh, I am fully on board with the idea that US soccer has been too arrogant over the past couple of years, at least. And I'm thinking of mm-hmm. that Trinidad game. I don't want to talk about what happened on the field so much, but the, uh, yeah. the actually what happened on the field was we just sent the same 11 out because we thought that would do the job, right? Without overthinking it. And Bruce mm-hmm. Arena saying, I've really thought about that game. I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, but also, that remember the whole thing of uh, the players being piggybacked over the uh, the flooded 
exterior of the yep. field and US soccer, the US soccer social media feed kind of making fun of it and tweeting it out and, you know, really upsetting the local press in Trinidad. All that stuff is arrogance. That absolutely is arrogance. And I think that maybe bleeds into the idea of um, kind of letting the ship drift a little bit over the last couple of months and not having anyone be like, oh, we're not this sort of shining palace of an institution that everybody wants to run towards. We should maybe, you know, we're not this utopia that everyone wants to be part of. We maybe should make more effort to make sure that we recruit people and don't just assume that they want to come to us because, and, and now the result is that you maybe lose people. Yeah, I mean, I, it, maybe it's a little bit of a like, chicken of the egg situation because, like, if that were Barcelona, if Barcelona were carried across, if they're playing some yeah, but like, Barcelona. lower team in the Champions League. But I guess that's my point, is, like, if it's Barcelona, you understand them. Like, oh, they don't want to get blisters because that could mess them up in La Liga. Yeah. And so, like, there is that element of, like, is there an assumption that, like, oh, we are that good, we deserve this sort of, sort of level of treatment? Or is it, like, we deserve it. this level of treatment and there's an assumption there. I don't know. It's just, it's difficult to say. Cause I can understand how if you're a professional, like you're feed your livelihood, you're worried about getting blisters and going back to your club. Oh team. no, no. Wait, oh, I mean, well, that guy's getting carried across. Wait, wait. I think it's, it's kind of fine for the players to not have mm-hmm. to get their feet wet. Right. What's not fine was the kind of mocking of it that happened. Right. By uh, US soccer. That's what oh, I'm talking okay. about. That's the sort of, um, I mean, I might be burning some bridges. Here, oh, right? but okay, okay, I'm okay. talking I'm about the sort of institutional now. arrogance. If we are this sort of great power of the region and everyone will, everyone will come flocking to us. Oh, uh, okay. I'm with you now. Cause like, yeah, that makes more sense. And then the, and then the idea there would be like, why? Po- like, like if you're going to carry guys across the water, do it. But yep. why post that and put it on social media and make it sort of like, can you believe how ridiculous this is? Yep. Okay, now I'm totally with you. Yeah. Yes, that's definitely arrogant. Yeah, this uh, the Trinidad Federation had the um, the audacity to have a gigantic storm the day, a couple of days before the game, right? That was the other point. It wasn't really... <laughs> It was, was just, it audacity or was it a supervillain controlling the weather, Daryl? I mean, it could me. be that. It could be that. Maybe, <laughs> may, yeah, maybe there's a supervillain in the Mexican Federation who plotted this all along. Yeah. <laughs> what about, so one thing I just want to uh, say is like, maybe this is another point of the part of the new era of U.S. soccer, which starts February 10th slash 11th. Whomever wins that election, there is a new era one way or another, because it's not the Sunil Galati era. Um, I do think there needs to be more humility about U.S. soccer and recognizing our place in the world. And that just because Jonathan Gonzalez has gone along so far, you should maybe make a bit of extra effort to uh, to cap time. Um, yeah, I mean, really, really, what this feels like. Like, sorry to keep going with analogies, but um, <laughs> if you haven't if you haven't seen the TV show Turn, uh, this won't be a spoiler because we know historically it happened. Um, but it reminds me a little bit of like the Benedict Arnold plot line, and not to say that Jonathan Gonzalez is a traitor, not saying that at all, but I'm saying that it is this like figure that everybody is really excited about and respects and wants to have included but then like minor slights don't get addressed minor grievances aren't resolved people just assume like oh he's here he's happy whatever and the longer you don't deal with that the more another party can come in and say hey he looks slightly angry he looks slightly annoyed by this oh his feelings were hurt by that we can play up how we're never going to do that and how we take care of our own and suddenly you can start to see that sort of loyalty dip a little bit and that's sort of how i feel about it it's like there was there was like smart moves by the Mexican Federation to make this happen, but it was certainly obvious things that a lot of people were like, that's not good. He's clearly annoyed by that. Somebody Mm -hmm. resolve that. And because of arrogance or a lack of control or a lack of oversight in U S soccer, here we are. One thing that I keep going back to, uh, Paul Kennedy from soccer America pointed this out Mm -hmm. is that, um, I mentioned earlier that Tab Ramos called Gonzalez up for the, uh, the U20 CONCACAF Championship, which is the World Cup qualifier. Um, then the U20 World Cup was, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was in May. Um, I think uh-huh. he was either, he was in consideration or on the preliminary roster. And it's the final 21-man roster. He was not, Jonathan Gonzalez was not included. And he is, he was not, yeah. he's a little younger. I think Tyler Adams ended up being the youngest player on that U20 roster. And Jonathan Gonzalez is a little younger than Tyler Adams. But I wonder if Tab Ramos kind of either underrated Gonzalez slightly because this kid was like playing in Liga MX is the next by July, right? Which is two, two or three months later. He definitely could have played at the U20 World Cup, right? So did yeah. Tab Ramos underestimate his talents or did Tab Ramos overestimate how secure he was with US soccer? Oh, I mean, I would say things could be two things, but things can also be neither of those things. Like it <laughs> things, can be the things Tab can Ramos be no thought. things. I mean, <laughs> I mean, yeah, just in the sense that like it could well be the Tab Ramos thought, okay, I've got, like other players who I can play at this position, this kid is young, his team want him, so I'll let him go back, I'll focus on other things. 
but there can also be like I'm sure you and your wife have had disagreements. You and I have had disagreements where it's sort of like no, I don't think it's honest. Mean some no, in either no, case, not. But like <laughs> I assume you mean something. You assume that I mean something, but we never clarify what the other means, and then it yeah, becomes yeah. like, well, you did this. No, I did. Like that's an easy thing to happen, and I could see Tavaremos think. Well, you know, he he was he was good with the squad, but we didn't really give him any minutes. I'd rather him go back to his club and not, you know, waste his time bringing him all the way to the World Cup. Um, yeah, and so, yeah, I'll just send him back. But then not, but then, but then the key part there being like, but then not conveying that and being like, hey, mm-hmm. just so you know, here's why I'm not including you, but I still really want, really want you involved, and just sort of assuming that oh, he must know that I considered him, and this is why I didn't choose him. Right. But if you don't make that crystal clear, then it's not clear. And for the record, anyone keeping score, um, it ended up being what Gedeon's LLM started at defensive midfield for the US in that tournament and got injured early on. Um, uh, Derek Jones, uh, Derek Jones from Philly, uh, filled in later. I was yeah. quite impressed with Derek Jones through that tournament. He's a guy that you know could still have a big future. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think Eric Palmer Brown stepped into defensive midfield, possibly during the World Cup. He definitely did during the uh, the qualifying tournament as well. So those are the players uh-huh. that sort of got the spot instead of Jonathan Gonzalez. Yeah. Tyler Adams, I guess, was in central midfield too. Um, one other thing, what about the idea that, uh, to maybe make more of an apology for that, the idea of uh, Gonzalez not going to the U20 World Cup in May helps him get more time with Monterey and force his way towards that first team and then makes his first team debut in July. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think that's what happened. Yeah, that makes sense, right? Because I mean, things are complicated think this way. Different. No, but I mean, I just still think that like what you go back to then is that clearly, yeah, he did that. But then you've got to, someone's got to call him and say, hey, we saw you play this weekend. Great job. I yeah. mean, you compare that. Well, that's to, what like, that's what uh, Arena what... did in August, at least. Right. So that's that's where it comes. That's the next part I was getting to is Arena apparently called him in August and said, you know, you're on the radar and all that sort of stuff. And then in hindsight, it would have been great if he'd have been called up for the September or October games <laughs> while he, after he'd actually made his debut and was impressing in Liga Emekis. And the problem to me seems to be that Bruce Arena thought, well, we'll qualify for the World Cup with the players we've got and then I'll call him up afterwards, right? So it's this like slightly arrogant well, thing of we'll take care of that and then we'll call him up. In hindsight, it would have been better to call him in in September and cap time. Well, I want to I want to like take issue with one thing there though. Um like there like a long time ago when like Twitter was kind of first being established, I remember I was in charge of the Total Soccer Show Twitter account. Yeah. And you were like, "Hey man, like if you want to keep it going, if you want to grow it, like you got to tweet more." And I was like, "I tweeted like this weekend." And you're like, "Yeah, you tweeted once on like Sunday Saturday morning. <laughs> that ain't going to get the job done." And it was and at I Seth MacFarlane. Bit... <laughs> what did you say it again? <laughs> and it was at Seth MacFarlane. Yeah, I think it probably was. I'm glad that you remember this. But, like, I guess that's how I feel, though, about Bruce Arena is, like, yeah, even that one call, like, I compare that to, like, Urban Meyer when he was the head coach of Florida. Like, as I recall, they had to change the recruiting laws because he was texting recruits, like, every day to be like, hey, man, it's all you played this weekend. Hey, hope the workout went well. How would it leg day go? Like, he was on top of it. Yeah. That's how you get people. And I know there are folks out there like Alexi Lalas today on Twitter saying, like, like, that's not what it should be about. You shouldn't be recruiting people. But if you want, I mean, just think about, like, if, if you were listening to us talk about this and you're at your office, just think about if your boss never, ever acknowledges what you're doing except to say, hey, uh, so you did good on that one report. Uh, we'll think about, you know, getting you a raise sometime. Like, that's not going to get it done. But if your boss every couple of days is like, hey, you're doing great. Hey, I love that. Hey, awesome stuff. Hey, I'm paying attention to that. It lets you know that your work is being appreciated. Yeah. But if you're only getting that once in a while, then you're still not really getting that. So does this raise the idea that um, maybe the new structure – that's been proposed and will probably be enacted of having a general manager really yeah. is a good idea to have someone whose job so. it is to yeah. keep track of all this stuff. Um, and then, but it's also then important who that person is, right? You need that person to be someone who's, mm-hmm. you know, got tabs on everything and is very good at those sort of, um, you know, making sure that players know that they are appreciated. And for the U S I would say as much as any country, the U S really is, and has a lot of players with sort of dual national ties. So it's almost more mm-hmm. important from a U.S. perspective to stay on top of this stuff, right? There's, you know, Giuseppe Rossi and all that from the past. Nevin Supertich yep. and so yeah. on. Yeah, yeah. 100%. 100%. And, and I agree with that. Do you have more to say on that? Because I wanted to go off on something else you just said. Uh, not really, except that, um, you know, the, it's too late now, but maybe we should have had a general manager several years ago. Yeah. I think that is one thing that I would like to see come out of this, is that you have a person who is sort of more focused on that from day to day. Yeah. But I do also want to say, I, I have seen a lot of people, I had a, an interaction with one person on Twitter, again, whose name I forget, I apologize, but I'm sitting in traffic, so that's his life. <laughs> um, basically saying like, oh, you know, the world was falling apart when we lost Giuseppe Rossi and when we lost Nevin Subotic and like these things happen. 
And yes, that's true. And it, it doesn't mean that Jonathan Gonzalez is going to be, you know, he's going to win the Ballon d'Or and win the World Cup for Mexico and look like there's no guarantee that he makes the U.S. the best team in the world. But we can say with some confidence that he was like on the on one of the best teams in Mexico starting regularly and looked like one of their best players. Yep. And it's a blow to the United States to lose a player of that caliber at such a young age to our arch rival within the region at a time when the United States is in like an ultimately vulnerable state in a way that they never have been before, yep. I would argue. And I... so I think like, yes, it's, it's, I'm not trying to say that this like ruins U S soccer or ruins the team forever. There's going to be lots of very talented players, but it is a very big blow. The likes of which I do not think the United States has ever suffered. Yeah. There are, there are other talented midfielders, right? From Western a recruitment McKinney's... standpoint, from a recruitment standpoint, I should add. Western McKinney is going to have a great career. Tyler Adams is yeah. probably going to have a great career. Jonathan Gonzalez is going to have a great career. He may have a better career yeah. than those other two players I just mentioned, right? There are already rumors of him sort of being linked with very, very big European clubs. He is only yeah. 18 and he's in the best 11 um, of Liga Emeki's this season. And yeah. watch, watching him play, I think I read some um, analysis by Adam Bells of the Scuff newsletter, who essentially said there's still some moments where, you know, maybe he's like um, passing decisions on the ball and that are not sort of elite. They're not, you know, there's still stuff to be worked on. But in terms of um, defensive midfield sort of closing down, winning the ball, he's already at an elite level. And I can really see that. Mm-hmm. Right? You watch the way he closes yeah. down, it's reminiscent of like an N'Golo Conte, those kind, of, those kind of players who can read the game and can put pressure on people. He's already there. And that's such a hard skill excuse me, skill set, and yep. he's already got it. Mm-hmm. The other important yeah. aspect I want to get, so he's a very, very important player. You're going to hear about him for a lot. This is going to hurt for a decade and more, right? When we play Mexico, when he mm-hmm. plays for Mexico, all that kind of stuff. The, the other element here to me is I was really excited about the United States men's national team having a Mexican-American superstar sort of at yep. the core of the Agreed. team. I think, I think it would have been really important to build the team around a Mexican-American that everybody really, really loved and sort of got on board with. I think it would have said a lot about the United States, especially at this political moment as well, which um, I'm not going to say is to blame for this happening, but it certainly didn't help in any way, right? No, I mean, yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I, yeah I'll agree with that. But I'll, I'll also say this, though, that like I know you... I uh, have had some tweets today about like the like one of the frustrating things. There are many frustrating things with this, but one of them is that like he has been sort of our way into Liga Mekis. Yeah, and I absolutely. know a lot of we've had a lot of responses saying like, oh, but there's this guy and there's this guy and there's yeah. this guy, and that is true. There are lots of Americans or dual national uh, eligible players playing in Liga Mekis, but the difference is to your point, like he is one of the best eleven. Like mm-hmm. he is a a budding superstar in that league, and it's exciting to go watch him regularly play for one of the top teams versus, oh yeah, Jonathan Bornstein might be starting. Oh yeah, like um, Jose Francisco Torres is on the bench, but maybe he'll get a couple minutes. Like, it's just not quite that same level. Well, because he represented the optimism of the post-World Cup yep. 2018 qualification failure. Exactly. He represented that next generation mm-hmm. optimism, right? So that's why I was so excited about it. Um, what about the, yeah. so weirdly, we haven't talked about the fact that it's a uh, World Cup qualification failure. How much do you think yeah. that plays a part? Because I think I, I, I argued aggressively at the start of this show that it was about sort of not contacting him in November, not making clear to him that he's wanted. Um, but there's also the very simple argument that like, hey, if we qualify for the World Cup, it would have been a lot easier to keep him. Yeah. I mean, I think if we qualify for the World Cup, that's certainly one huge card that Mexico can't play that, hey, you're going to be eligible for a world cup right now. I mean, yeah. that's something that if the United States qualify, I mean, that's really, it is like if the United States had qualified, Bruce arena is still in charge. Bruce arena had said, Oh, he was going to get looks. So I think that removed a huge, uh, like card that Juan Carlos Osorio could play. Mm-hmm. I mean, I still think Mexico are putting pressure on him. I still think his teammates are putting pressure on him. Of course. But I don't that's think that's an it underrated has quite aspect, the isn't effect. it? The fact that he's playing for Monterrey. I saw uh, uh, Carlos Montes, the really talented youngish, I think he's like 20 or so, mm-hmm. centre back, um, tweeted sort of, you know, welcome to Jonathan Gonzalez. So they, obviously his teammates have been saying, hey, you well, know who you should play yeah. for? Hey, you know who you should play for, right? And then his parents, well, I think, so his, I think his parents this- live in California, but his parents are from Mexico. Apparently they were both very keen that he played for the Mexican national yeah. team instead of the US men's national team. So he's been getting pressure from all sides. And maybe you're right, like mm-hmm. one phone call from Bruce Arena in August isn't enough to counteract all that persuasion from every angle, plus dangling a World Cup uh, possibility in front of him as well. No, and we had, we had a listener a long time ago point out that like the United States might have already been lucky 
just in the sense that Monterey didn't have that many Mexican internationals or like Mexican national team regulars. Yeah. Because if he's playing for a club where you've got three or four guys in there, if he's playing for Pachuca or uh, Tigres, something like that, yeah, he gets more pressure, I have to believe, if he's playing with two guys who are going to be starting at the World Cup. Mm-hmm. They're probably in his ear saying, hey, man, you can start at the World Cup. Yep. So I think the U.S. is lucky that it kind of held out. He held out as long as he did. I mean, that said, I like – you might not agree with this, like, and I understand why he made this decision. I'm still going to boo him. Like, if we're ever in a game where really? USA play in Mexico. Yeah, I mean, because that's the thing is, like, at the end of the day, I get why he did it. I understand why you would choose Mexico. But that doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. Like, I can understand why he would want to do that and how it benefits his career. I get all of that. It's still, at the end of the day, is that I'm a U.S. national team fan, and that's still a pretty big bummer. I, so weirdly, I so obviously from the past six months, I really, really like mm-hmm. Jonathan. I don't know him, obviously, but um, I really sort of have got, got a lot of affection for the player and the person from what I've seen. Um, yeah. That didn't change this morning. I didn't start sort of blaming him or feeling negative towards him. I really, all my negativity was towards uh, US soccer for not sort of locking this down. And that, yeah, that really hasn't changed for me. So I don't see myself booing him uh, in the future. If anything, he's kind of made, you would say for his career, he's probably made the right choice right now. Just because there's a chance he now starts at a World Cup? I mean, not just the World Cup thing, but like it seems like the Mexican Federation is operating uh-huh. uh, much more successfully than the U.S. Soccer Federation right now. Um, I mean, it's going gonna, it's gonna to help him in terms of uh, playing for the national team where he's playing his club soccer. There's no guarantee that U.S. Soccer mm-hmm. gets more competent in the future. You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, but, uh, but I mean, I guess I would say that like if, if I'm a Man United fan and there's a player that I really, 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 really enjoy – and he ends up signing for Man City, I'm going to enjoy him less. That's yeah. just kind oh, yeah. of the way it's going to work. And so that's where it is for me. It's not necessarily that I'm like him personally. It's just more so that now he is a member of the Mexican national team, <laughs> a team that I am not always particularly fond of. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, that factors into things. Okay, but there'll be only one person booing in the office when we, when we watch that game. I mean, li- neither one of us has ever booed a team that I can <laughs> recall. Yeah. And I don't plan to start doing that. It's just more so... You know, it's just I'm not going to care as much about yeah, his course, career, yeah, which course, is yeah. definitely a bummer because we've invested so many hours and minutes yeah, on the show into discussing and watching and reviewing. And so it's definitely disappointing. And I think that's part of it as well, is that it felt like you and I had kind of been in there for a while. Like yep. we, even before he really became this like established starter, we were excited about him like I would say a good year ago at least. So, like, I mean, it, so it's definitely just a little bit more of a bummer. Uh, to see things where they are. I'm with you. Still no booing, but I do hope that whether it's Weston McKenney or Tyler Adams, if there's some sort of 50-50 tackle, I hope they win the ball. <laughs> okay, you, let, me, let me put it this way. You're right. Who is the wrong term? Yeah. Who is the wrong term? But it's more of just that I will be like, meh. You know? Like, I mean, I won't, like a, like I won't be in a plotting. hurry to watch Monterey games anymore, if that makes sense. There we go. That's what changes exactly. for me. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, here's the final kicker, Taylor. Assuming the yeah. paperwork goes through, right? Because this has to be filed yeah. with FIFA. That there's one time switch has to be, you know, all uh, stamped and signed and approved and all that. Gonzalez could make his debut for Mexico January 31st against Bosnia and Herzegovina. Oh, so lovely. the US plays them um, January 28th, right? The end of the January camp. Mm-hmm. Mexico plays Bosnia January 31st. So we'll sort of be watching the US play against him and uh, against Bosnia. And then we'll watch Gonzalez play against the same team in a green jersey. Yep. So and I would, I would add though, that, like, and I know people are then probably going to be frustrated by, look, and like Mexico caught him up for the January camp. U.S. didn't even do that. Like that shows you right there. I would argue that that's because Mexico are preparing to go to a World Cup. So they have, so for him, it's more important to play for Mexico now because you might look really good against Bosnia. And then well, one call of the story is like, all right, it's his job to lose. Yeah. versus for the United States, it's going to be like, all right, well, yep, he's still in the pool and we're pretty excited about him, yeah. but it doesn't really change anything. So I understand why the U.S. wouldn't call him in. Well, Again, it's just an issue of you got to still got to talk to him. Here's the other angle. Um, uh, Monterey would not have been obligated to release him, right, because it's yeah. not a FIFA official uh, date. Um, so yeah. the, the U.S. could have tried and they could have said, nope, uh, we've got league games like, through January, February, right? You're not having him. Uh, why should we help the U.S. soccer team, right? But the Mexican Federation says, hey, can you release him? It's really important. You're a Mexican team. We're the Mexican Federation. We're all like walk- working towards the same goal of uh, doing well at the World Cup. Monterey could release him to Mexico and not release him to the U.S. Soccer Federation. That makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. It doesn't I mean, make me happy, possible. but it makes sense. Think, 
I don't think there's always a lot of love between Liga Mekis clubs and the Mexican Federation. I don't know how popular the Mexican Federation is at all times. Well, it's, it's more, more popular than the U.S. Soccer Federation, put it that way. That is definitely true. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so speaking of, the same day that this news... So this news, I'm not sure what time it dropped this morning, but just after noon, uh, we got the 30-man roster for the U.S. men's yeah. national team, January Not camp. great timing. Not, Not great, great timing. timing. Also, part of the, the weird sort of U.S. soccer arrogance that I was talking about, no mention of this Jonathan Gonzalez decision, um, no comment uh, uh, from U.S. soccer about it. They're kind of just pretending it hasn't happened, which I don't think is a good approach. I think this is the kind of thing you should address head on because it kind of makes the 30-man uh, January camp announcement look kind of weird and silly, right? When especially the branding around it, the message around it has been, this is all about youth. This is all about the future. Um, and no one mentioned that probably the most talented player of all we've, we've failed to secure. Um, so I guess um, I'll, I'll be talking to Matt Doyle from MLSsucker.com tomorrow about the 30-man uh, January camp roster. But very quick overview, Taylor. I'm going to assume that you've seen it. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. You are correct. So obviously people should know, you know, no European players because it's only players that are available end of January, mid-January, end of January. Uh, no senior players in MLS. So no Josie Altador, no Michael Bradley, no Clint Dempsey, no Jermaine Jones, all of that. It's like Christian Ramirez, Tyler Adams, uh, Walker Zimmerman, a lot of sort of, uh, th- those are your sort of known names. And then a lot of younger names who are from the U20 World Cup roster, like uh, Justin Glad, mm. Brooks Lennon. So... I'm going to talk to Matt Doyle about that tomorrow. And then after that, I'm going to do my best to try and get optimistic about seeing those players in action. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, it, it feels really hard right now, right? Because this Jonathan Gonzalez news is so overwhelming. Yeah, I, I think I think the other thing that really bumped me out, there are a lot of things that bumped me out about this, but it's also that like, it felt like, okay, we've been dealt the blow now of not qualifying for the World Cup. We can start to rebuild. And I genuinely think that now this makes it worse until after the World Cup. Because now it is sort of like yep. we're not even rebuilding with our, like the most talented parts. It's sort of like we're rebuilding, but we don't have this guy, and that's kind of a huge bummer. Meanwhile, he's probably going to be playing at the World Cup. I really do think he'll make that Mexico team. If he doesn't, then we shall see. But I think that also really does hurt enthusiasm a little bit, and that's something that hopefully – the new coach, whomever that might be when they come in, and the new president, whenever he or she comes in, can uh, can help maybe kickstart some excitement. Um, Taylor, I've just got some uh, breaking-ish news. It's not major, but What's it's that? sort of a comment that illuminates some of the stuff we were saying. Um, there's a quote from uh, Thomas Rongan, um, who was, you know, uh-huh. uh, under Bruce Arena uh, doing some uh, some scouting work. He said he's one of the people that's been in touch with Jonathan Gonzalez recently. He said, this is a quote on Soccer America. Um, I've been to his house three times in the last year as the chief scout for the U.S. men's national team. Um, he's as American as they come. He represented our U17 team, our under-20 team at the World Cup as well. That is not true. He did not do that. Um, not going to the World Cup ourselves. This has been tough. I know going forward we might lose some battles. And then, you know, talks about how it's a big loss. So Thomas Rungan says he visited him. But also he didn't go to the U20 World Cup. So I'm not sure what that quote is all about. Yeah, that, that feels more like like I'm covering my ass. <laughs> like, if anything, because like, that doesn't... Because honestly like the logical conclusion to that is this wasn't like if you're going to take that argument if you're going to say i visited his house the logical conclusion to that is he chose this for reasons other than our recruitment like that is what he's trying to imply there without saying it and i no, feel like sorry, you I, don't say I didn't, it i didn't read the second half of the quote because it was getting long but there was essentially uh-huh. um his mom and dad wanted to play for mexico mexico's going to a world cup it was the kind of uh the the, the turn that took and that's why he made that decision yeah, but you're still not saying it. Like, right. I guess that's the thing is like, if you're just kind of like, and you know, there were these other factors and that probably played a part. Like, you're still not saying like, no, we did our job. And so what you're doing then is being like, I did my job. I don't know what everybody <laughs> else did. But in the end, he played for Mexico. Like that, like, I can appreciate what Thomas Rongan is trying to say, but it also just makes me more frustrated in the end. Oh, so I guess here's to February 10th, because we kind of need a reset and a refresh, right? Yeah. I mean, I, like, like, Again, it's worth noting that clubs lose players, national teams lose players. It's what happens. It's the nature of the beast. He might end up winning the Ballon d'Or. He might end up not playing the World Cup and kind of falling through the ranks. I don't think that's going to happen. I think U.S. soccer will be okay. It's just, it's just still a blow that I don't feel like necessarily trying to put a positive spin on yet. I don't, I don't really appreciate the narrative of like, look, man, this happens. I don't know why we're all upset. Yeah, like, yeah. He wants to play for somebody else, and it's, then he doesn't truly feel like he's American or whatever. The I only, just think that that is 
Go ahead. I was going to say the only possible positive spin is that this is kind of a wake-up call to U.S. soccer in the future to not assume that players all want to play for U.S. soccer. And that even when they've kind of committed that you should still sort of keep sealing that deal until it's 100% official yeah. and there's no going back. I don't, I don't disagree with that at all, Daryl. And I, and I think that you will agree with me when I say this. Man, I am ready for people to be, I'm not going to use the popular term, I'm going to say I'm ready for people to be awakened. <laughs> like, I'm tired of like, this is a wake-up call. Like, how many things in the past two years or so have been <laughs> wake-up calls? Like, I'm ready for people to be wide awake and dealing with stuff. Not saying woke, but I'm saying, <laughs> like, I'm just, I'm just tired of that. Like, yes, I feel like we've had to do a silver lining. Maybe this is a wake-up call. Maybe this kind of sets well, the fire. I mean, I'd include myself in this because I think I've been someone who over the past few years has been saying, like, everyone needs to panic less. Like, I know we all got burned by Giuseppe Rossi, but maybe everyone just calm yeah. down a little bit, sort of, you know, yeah. we'll get there, it'll be fine. And this is the first evidence that to me this kind of a wake-up call to me to not always be so relaxed about it because this is a player that i invested a lot of um time and thought um just into the possibility of him playing for the u.s national team i mean not that i actually did anything to help recruit him i'm saying you know what i mean i spent a lot of time watching footage and talking about him on the show and all that this is the first time i've really been burned by someone that i was very yeah. heavily invested in so it's kind no, of a wake-up like, call and- to me personally in that way Oh, no, I, I get that. And, like, I do want to say, like, yeah, in the past, you and I, like, I almost brought it up, but, like, you and I have had those disagreements about, like, I don't think we need to, I think your approach has always been, like, I don't think we need to be so obsessed yeah. with, there's this dual national, but he, like, like got talked to by Germany. Oh, we got to get in there. Yep. Like, yeah, I would have said, relax, don't worry. Except, I think I've got this weirdly well, optimistic outlook that has been ve- proved very much wrong in this case. But also, I would say that, like, but it doesn't even really merit mentioning, in my opinion, because Jonathan, it's, it's just Jonathan Gonzalez. Like, that's what it comes down to. It's like, mm-hmm. Giuseppe Rossi was exciting, but it felt like a burn because he was like that first big player. Nevin Subotic, I never even really thought was going to play for the U.S. national team. But this is a guy who we both watched and saw and appreciated what he was capable of. And is, I don't think there has, I said it before, I don't think there's been a player of this caliber that has ever been, quote unquote, lost by the United States. Yep. And so like... You not being so freaked out about it in the past, I think, is like, that's the good approach to have. I just think that this is sort of so outside of what was expected, like, like a player of that caliber leaving, that mm-hmm. it's naturally going to be uh, a different process. Does that make sense? You <laughs> it does. Say? It absolutely does. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I feel like we, I didn't plan for this to go this long, but I guess there was a lot to talk about, and I'm sure we'll talk about it more in the future. I'll talk about it with Matt Doyle tomorrow as well, I believe. Mm-hmm. So that show should be out around uh, 1 p.m., 2 p.m., uh, Tuesday afternoon. Uh, Matt Doyle and, uh, and me talking about the U.S. Men's National Team January camp. Final question, Tyler. Are you still in traffic? Uh, no, I, I, am, I am now sitting in the grocery store parking lot. I've, I went the very long way that involved getting off on a bunch of different exits and... Uh, Maybe doing some illegal traffic maneuvers, but Uh-oh. here I am. Oh, I wouldn't. <laughs> I can't edit that out. I'm sorry. That's going to be that's going to be published. I guess if no one yeah, saw it, they can't. They can't do it. Right? Specific incidents to go after me for. <laughs> what, I'll be what's your license plate number again? Let's try. <laughs> <laughs> but here right. is my social just in case. <laughs> All right, Taylor. Well, thank you for taking the time to emergency pod with me today. I'm sad that we had to do it, but I'm glad I got to talk to you about it. Yeah, right back, everybody. It's always nice to have that sort of outlet. To, uh, to go back and forth. You and I, worth noting, have not talked about this yet uh, as, before we started recording and had no like pre-roll. It was just straight into it. So I'm glad that we could figure some stuff out. Yeah, cathartic at least a little bit, right? Okay, Taylor. Yeah, um, so. I'll talk to you again later in the week. All right, pal.